Shares in NVIDIA trading higher today ahead of the tech giant's highly anticipated conference. That event will focus on the upcoming product line. Apparently 300,000 people, 300,000 tech heads will be tuning in around the world. We may hear more about the company's vision for advancing AI in coming years. Our guest says this event is the most important of the week and maybe the whole month. We're joined by Dan Rahinton, Portfolio Manager at IA Global Asset Management. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. What should we look out for from this NVIDIA presentation? We need to look out for the next generation of chips and what their capabilities and the actual architecture looks like. And the second point, Andrew, is the actual pricing. So we know they're going to be significantly more powerful, but is it two times more powerful? Is it three times more powerful? And what is the value per dollar that NVIDIA is going to charge? We know that it's likely going to be a premium, but are they going to match the premium with the price performance? Or is it going to be giving some value to the customers to incentivize adoption? Those are the critical questions of the day, with some of the secondary points being what's going to happen on the networking side, what's going to happen on CUDA, and some of the other use cases that they could throw out there. But it's definitely the event of the week, and I agree. It's going to be the event of the month, more likely than not to. It, does the company face a dilemma here? They could slap big, fat prices on these new devices, but risk uh, turning away customers in the long term? It depends on really the performance that they can deliver. Mm -hmm. Pricing for performance and pricing per wafer has been a, a, a normal pricing paradigm within the semiconductor space for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So this isn't necessarily unique. It's just finding that right harmony. But we'll really find out at 4 o'clock today with the keynote, and especially tomorrow when we get some more of the financial details. But I will say expectations are, it's hard to say that they're not sky high. Okay, I love this line from you, Dan. You say we've been talking about the Magnificent Seven. I suppose Tesla has kind of dropped out of that. Maybe Apple has. But you say we could, when it comes to NVIDIA, be talking just about the Magnificent One before too long? Yeah, it's been basically the major driver of markets and the broader value chain that NVIDIA participates in has been a disproportionate driver of returns for this year and definitely for last year as well. So. Move away Apple, move away Netflix. There's really one game in town for the time being. But this is the one event where we're going to really see, is that going to be the theme of the year or was it just the theme of the first quarter? What about, what about this? I mean, obviously, momentum has been a, a part of the rapid rise in these tech stocks. Is momentum a thing, though, that can turn negative pretty quickly? Once uh, stocks start dropping, can you get negative momentum? Yep. Momentum cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. And I actually think we're at an interesting point. So this is a great time to have this conversation because we're at one of the bleeding edges of the momentum rally. That's not to say that's bearish. It could also be bullish. But momentum can really cut in both directions. So when you have this level of crowding, this level of interest, you could don't be surprised if Nvidia can have big moves upwards and also big moves downwards. Mm -hmm. Mentally, as investors, condition ourselves at these points in the cycle, at these points in the market, to see days where Nvidia could be up 10% and down percent, 10 percent intraday. And we're talking about a two trillion dollar company, let alone the entire value chain in semiconductors. So we're in that world right now, and we're living it. NVIDIA opened upwards of 5% this morning, and now it's down 3%. Just another day, Andrew. Just What's another fun? day. Um, so far, a lot of the excitement has been about this so-called generative AI, which is great at faking the use of language and big companies adopting AI. But you say to keep the momentum up, we, we have to see broadening into areas such as healthcare. Healthcare, other parts, more sovereign type of customers, more academic research, because there's only so much cloud capex and cloud data center growth to be had. It's enormous. It's huge. The enterprise has been the biggest market for a long time, but you want to see the breakthrough in other parts of the market. You want to see drugs being discovered, different insights, more closer to personalized medicine, because it shows you that the algorithms and the training and the data that big data complex can really solve bigger problems than just making text to video 
or some type of Photoshop that's more effective than, than what Adobe's product historically was for the past 20 years. You need to see real use cases that hit everyone's day-to-day -day lives and not some of the more flashy stuff that is really capturing the imagination right now. Could we switch to this um, reported possible partnership in which Google would supply Apple with AI technology? For one thing, the Wall Street Journal noting that this will be a reversal of the massive royalties that Google has been paying Apple for including its search engine in iPhones. I would say for both companies, this is a great news story. But I would just take a little, we're still in speculative land right now. The story just broke by Bloomberg, and, or BNN Bloomberg, I should say. And we have to be specific around just where we are. We're not at the final stages of these agreements. You could still have Microsoft push further, OpenAI push further. So a lot could still happen, Andrew. Mm -hmm. But the idea that Google paying money to Apple to the expected tune of what had been for search about $20 billion a year now being reversed, I would just say we're in the negotiating phase. There's a huge incentive for Google and the right long-term incentive for shareholders of Google to have Apple get paid to adopt this the same way Apple gets paid $20 billion a year in basically pure profit to use Google search. So the licensing conversation I'm more suspicious about, but everything else all I heard was good news today for Apple shareholders and Google shareholders. Sorry, Dad, what do you mean the licensing conversation you're a little wary of? The, when I mean the licensing point, it's the idea that Apple is going to start paying Google for the technology. There could be many other type of revenue sharing oh. uh, uh, approaches that take place. So the part I'm most suspicious about is the idea that Apple is going to start paying Google and not the other way around which has been the historic relationship. I hope that makes it a bit more clear. And finally, to a smaller company, but one of great interest to Canadian investors, Nuve, they have had some troubles uh, in the recent past. They are apparently looking for a buyer or they have been entertaining potential offers. Yeah, um, I'm not surprised. The leverage at Nuve is okay, so it's manageable. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the math on a leverage buyout can work with Advent or any other party that decides to tango. I think the biggest issue for investors that are speculating on Nuve right now is what's gonna happen with the, the dual class structure that exists there. Oh. And Nuve as a whole in its position, it's nowhere near comparable to the leaders Visa and MasterCard in the value chain. A merchant acquirer is a more fluid model. So I'm not, we're not investors in the stock and that's not where we focus on in the payments ecosystem, mm -hmm. but I'm not surprised there's a deal happening. I think the biggest question mark around the deal is, can you do a leverage buyout without collapsing the dual cap class structure? And what premium do you pay for that? But Nube from a valuation standpoint, it's not a surprise to see some uh, takeover interest at these levels.